The U.S. warns of the strongest sanctions in history and makes 12 sweeping demands of Iran. Tehran dismisses the threats from the new Secretary of State, but what if it doesn't comply and is the U.S. seeking regime change in Iran? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Paranam. Iran's been given a list of 12 demands by the United States and warned that if it doesn't comply, it will face the strongest sanctions in history. The new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, also threatened that America was ready to respond if Iran resumed its nuclear activities, but declined to elaborate. Well, tensions between the two countries grew considerably when President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. But Pompeo's hardline stance goes far beyond the nuclear issue. First, Iran must declare to the IAEA full account of the prior military dimensions of its nuclear program and permanently and verifiably abandon such work in perpetuity. Second, Iran must stop enrichment and never pursue plutonium reprocessing. This includes closing its heavy water reactor. Third, Iran must also provide the IA with unqualified access to all sites throughout the entire country. Iran must end its proliferation of ballistic missiles and halt further launching or development of nuclear capable missile systems. Iran must release all U.S. citizens, as well as citizens of our partners and allies, each of them detained on spurious charges. Iran must end support to Middle East terrorist groups, including Lebanese Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Iran must respect the sovereignty of the Iraqi government and permit the disarming, demobilization, and reintegration of Shia militias. Iran must also end its military support for the Houthi militia and work towards a peaceful political settlement in Yemen. Iran must withdraw all forces under Iranian command throughout the entirety of Syria. Iran, too, must end support for the Taliban and other terrorists in Afghanistan and the region and cease harboring senior al-Qaeda leaders. Iran, too, must end the IRG Quds Forces support for terrorists and militant partners around the world. And two, Iran must end its threatening behavior against its neighbors, many of whom are U.S. allies. This certainly includes its threats to destroy Israel and its firing of missiles into Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. It also includes threats to international shipping and destructive, and destructive cyber attacks. Well, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani immediately rejected the demands. Here's what he had to say about Pompeo, a former head of the CIA. A guy who's been active in an espionage center in the U.S. and has now become the Secretary of State makes strange remarks. He wants us to make a decision for Iran and says Iran should do this or do that. This is funny and ridiculous. Who are you to decide about Iran? Who are you to decide about the world? Pompeo has returned to making strange statements. He says you should have light water and not heavy water. You shouldn't have enrichment and you should have other stuff. Come on, that was the past. It's over now. Well, let's bring in our guest now. Joining us from Washington is Michelle Dunn, a senior associate at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. In Tehran, Mohammed Mirandi, head of the American Studies postgrad program at the University of Tehran. And also in Washington, Ali Vyaz, director of the Iran Project at the International Crisis Group. A very warm welcome to all of you. Mr. Mirandi, Mike Pompeo has said that these are very basic requirements that aren't unreasonable, while President Rouhani has called them funny and ridiculous. How likely do you think it is that Iran will meet any of these demands? There's zero chance. I think uh, the whole speech was designed in a way to make sure that uh, uh, the Iranians would give a firm no. And no country would, even a, a very much smaller and weaker country, would not give in to any such demands. It's basically what the United States is doing is trying to drag us in, back into the 19th century, where they had more direct rule over countries than the sort of indirect rule that they have over much of the world, unfortunately, in our part of the world, at least. Iran is an independent country. 
it will it has fought for its independence for the last four decades. That was what the revolution was all about. And the United States has failed to reconcile itself with this fact. Uh, Iran has many grievances. Iran has many more grievances than the United States. The United States supported Saddam Hussein, gave him chemical weapons. They supported the Shah. They overthrew the Iranian national government. They've been imposing sanctions for decades. They've downed an Iranian airliner, killing almost 300 innocent civilians. And uh, today they've supported extremists in Syria. They're helping the Saudis destroy and demolish Yemen. And uh, they are supporting the Saudis, even though the Saudis are trying to strangle Qatar. This is the state of affairs as Iran sees it. And Iran sees the United States as the problem in this region. Michelle Dunn, if there was no chance that Iran was going to give in to any of these demands, why would the U.S. make them, do you think? What are the real motives behind this? I think what we've seen uh, from President Trump since he's been in office is a certain um, approach to foreign policy that is in some ways quite different from his predecessor. Uh, President Trump is intent on keeping his campaign promises, and this was one of them. He, uh, he very much promised to uh, undo or pull the United States out of what he viewed as a bad deal with Iran on its nuclear program. Uh, Trump wants to differentiate himself from uh, former President Obama. He wants to show uh, that, that he, Trump, is tough and that he can get things done. Uh, and frankly, he's also a bit heedless of the consequences. He doesn't believe that, you know, many of the consequences that people say would ensue, for example, from pulling out of an agreement like this really will happen. So we will see. Um, this is quite a, a, a strong, a kind of maximalist list of demands from Iran. I have to say, from my point of view, um, they are desirable things. I mean, in particular, regarding Iran's role in the region, the very bad role it has played in Syria and the terrible suffering that has brought about for the Syrian people, as well as other things. But I, I would say I don't think this list was made with the belief that Iran will just meet all of those things. I think it was meant to be a way of uh, putting all the grievances um, on the table at once and making clear that U.S. concerns about Iran um, are about its nuclear program, but go well beyond that and, and really relate to the role it is playing in the region. Mr. Vaz, what do you think of the implications, whatever the motives are for making these demands, what implications is it going to have now, now that they're on the table? Look, these were basically terms of surrender. Um, imagine if Iran had done the same thing, if Iran had exited the nuclear deal and then had demanded that the U.S. would leave the region, would stop supporting Israel and Saudi Arabia, were selling arms to countries in the GCC. Um, it's, it's really impossible to imagine that Iran would ever agree to these. I mean, if, if the administration truly believes that this is a possibility, it should probably also believe in unicorns. Um, the reality is, I think this was an indirect way for the Trump administration to say that it's seeking regime change in Iran. Uh, and you saw all the references that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo made to the Iranian people. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's also quite ironic because these are the same people that the U.S. will now put under tremendous uh, economic pressure uh, as a result of snapping back its sanctions. Uh, it will endanger their, their safety by depriving them uh, from being able to purchase civilian airplanes. Uh, and it has barred them from entering the United States. But nevertheless, I think the message that uh, Secretary Pompeo was trying to put across was that there would be no deal with this regime uh, because all the changes that he's asking for are, are just simply impossible to meet. Mr. Mirandi, what uh, impact do you think this strategy will have on Iranian people? Will more economic pain for Iranians, you know, lead them to turn on their leaders? Or could the U.S. plan backfire and actually unite Iranians further against the U.S.? I think that already it has united Iranian society in a way in which I haven't seen in, in many, many years. Uh, Trump is universally despised. And the demands that are being made by Trump from the Iranian perspective it, are, are ridiculous. Iran's missile defense capability is exactly what has protected Iran from American attacks over the past couple of decades. Every time a U.S. president says 
all options are on the table means that the Iranians should be prepared. Or, for example, pulling out of Syria, contrary to what your guest said, the U.S. Uh, Defense Intelligence Agency document of 2012 admits, points out, that the extremists were the dominant groups from early on in Syria and that the United and that U.S. allies in the region or client regimes in the region were the forces behind these extremist groups that wanted to create a Salafist entity between Syria and Iraq. And later that turned out to be ISIS. Or when Kerry admitted in a leaked audio tape that the United States allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus. Iran wasn't going to allow black flags to fly over Damascus and it wasn't going to allow them to fly over Baghdad. So the Iranians believe that the United States, what it has done is that it has destroyed Syria, it has destroyed Iraq, it has destroyed Libya, it has destroyed Lebanon, Yemen, and it has allowed Saudi Arabia to kidnap prime ministers and, and uh, strangle countries like Qatar. So the Iranians know that if they back down, that the United States will only be more demanding. The United States, as its things stand, we have signed an, a nuclear agreement. We made many concessions. Many in Iran thought it was a bad deal. But despite all that, when the government decided to join, the, to sign up to the agreement, everyone, those who opposed and supported the agreement, they all agreed that we must abide by our, our commitments. When the United States doesn't abide by its commitments, then there's nothing else to negotiate because in future they'll simply do the same thing all over again. And Michelle Dunn, do you think regime change is what the U.S. wants in Iran, that it doesn't actually want to negotiate with this regime? Because there are those who think that President Trump and Mike Pompeo want to, you know, cripple Iran economically so that they can bring the government back to the negotiating table to get more of what they want out of Iran. But there are others who think that while that might be what President Trump and the new Secretary of State might be interested in, there is a new a national security advisor, John Bolton, who wants something different, which is regime change. Uh, well, uh, let me get to that point in just a moment, Elizabeth. I do want to say um, that I disagree very much with what Mr. Mirandi said about Syria. I, it, it was never a U.S. strategy to create, I believe he said, a Salafist entity in Syria. Uh, that was never the case. And um, it, it is, uh, you know, and, and really, I, I have to say, I, I think uh, Iran and, you know, Iran did not go there to, to prevent uh, Sunni extremists in Syria. It went there to support the Syrian regime, its ally, and Iran has been party to, and Russia has been party to, um, the death of, you know, half a million Syrians and, and the millions made refugees and so forth, the real devastation of Syria. But apart from that, back to your question about regime change. I have to say, I do agree uh, with, with, with what Mr. Vias said, that um, the tone of this speech really does um, point to um, the, the desire, you know, on the part of the U.S. administration to see change inside Iran, but coming from Iranians. Now, the prospects of that, I have to say, I think are, are not strong, although we are seeing a lot of demonstrations, economically ba based demonstrations and dissatisfaction uh, with the regime in Iran on the part of its citizens. Um, whether this speech or this approach from the United States would, would somehow encourage that, I have to say I'm not very convinced of that. My guess is that what the administration has in mind is, um, is ratcheting up the pressure on Iran, and it's really aimed um, now at Iran's role in the region, Syria, Lebanon, um, Yemen, et cetera. Um, and, um, and, and I think they would be, they would certainly be still amenable. I mean, they're, they never said at this point that they wouldn't make any kind of deal with the current Iranian regime. Um, and we see they are willing to make deals with odious regimes such as North Korea. <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, that that's probably a long shot possibility. I agree. This is a very maximal set of demands, and it's, it's almost unthinkable that Iran will meet them. So I think the idea more is to, um, you know, is, is to signal, you know, and to put, put Iran on the outside again. You know, the Obama administration had hoped after the uh, the um, 
JCPOA to have a better relationship with the Iranian regime, had really hoped for a warming of relations between Iran and the United States. That did not happen, even though there was about a year and a half after, uh, after the deal was reached, before Obama left office, the door was open. But for its own reasons, um, the leadership in Iran didn't, didn't choose to go there. So that, that more optimistic hope on the part of the Obama administration never came through. And now we see the Trump administration adopting um, a much more pessimistic, in a way, uh, approach to Iran. Mr. Weiss, and who benefits Apart, uh, who benefits in the region from this pessimistic approach to Iran? You know, how much of the U.S. motives here are being driven by their regional allies in the region, like Israel, like Saudi Arabia? Well, I think Israel and Saudi Arabia and the UAE in the short term are the main beneficiaries uh, of the current situation. But I think it's short-sighted because I agree with Michelle that the idea here from the administration is that if you put Iran under tremendous economic pressure. Uh, given um, the impression in Washington that the system in Iran is quite fragile and vulnerable, uh, whether that's a realistic assessment or not is another question, but I think the protests that happened in Iran earlier this year and uh, the free fall of the currency uh, in Iran has given the impression in Washington uh, that uh, the system in Iran is vulnerable. Uh, so they believe that if they put Iran under economic pressure, uh, by definition, the system will have to um, uh, focus on its internal dynamics and therefore it would have less uh, to do in the region and to invest in the region. Um, I think this is a, a, a misguided calculation because if you look at the height of the sanctions regime in 2011 and 2012, a sanctions regime that was built on years of diplomacy, uh, and at the time that Iran was completely isolated and seen by the international community as the inflexible party at fault, uh, Iran was, in parallel to that, expanding its role in the region. That's when Iran started sending troops to Syria and Iraq. Um, and therefore, you come to the conclusion that Iran's role in the region is not a function of the amount of money it has it's in, in its bank accounts. It's a function of uh, the threat perception that it has about the regional dynamics and also opportunities it sees for expanding its influence in the region. Now, this in 2018 or 2019, without having the buy-in from U.S. Uh, allies like the Europeans or Russia and China, it's really hard to imagine that the U.S. would be able to restore maximum pressure on Iran in a way that it would either destabilize the system or to push it to behave uh, in a more moderate way in the region. Mr. Morandi, what do you make of that? Well, a number of things, quickly. One is that, going back to what I was saying about Syria, it, it, what I said is absolutely correct. In fact, uh, I would advise your guests to watch an Al Jazeera interview of the former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, the famous General Flynn, when he uh, said, admitted that the United States took a willful decision to support these groups, and no one in the United States uh, denied this afterwards. This was made a few years ago, and you can find it on the website. In addition to that, we have the admission through the WikiLeaks documents that the United States knew that Saudi Arabia was supporting ISIS in 2014. We have Biden's speech at Harvard, where he admitted that U.S. allies were all supporting the most atrocious groups. And, of course, the United States did nothing about it. So the U.S. role in Syria was uh, quite horrific. And, of course, right now it's occupying the country illegally. It has destroyed cities like Raqqa. And, and I can and, go on. And, and Mr. Morandi, with, you know, what about yes, Iran's but, role in Syria, which Michelle Dunn was speaking about, supporting a regime which has killed hundreds of thousands of people. Is it going to be able to continue its involvement in a war that costs it so much money when it's going to come under even more crippling sanctions by the US? Well, I would put it this way. In, in what happened in Syria, people were killed from all sides. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed by the militants, the extremists that the United States and its, and its regional allies supported. But you will we admit that the United States was 
the most number of people in no, Syria Iran, have been killed by no, the regime and no, its allies. No, but, Mr. Morandi, I will have, we've only got a few no, minutes let, left let me, in the program, and we do need to focus on Iran okay. and its role in the region. Well, in any case, the, the point that I was making is that Iran, the reason why Iran w went to Syria in 2015, by the way, is when Iranian troops went in large numbers, was after tens of thousands of foreign fighters were already facilitated to go to Syria by Western powers and with the support of the CIA. But in any case, what, the difference between now and a few years ago when the United States imposed uh, crippling sanctions, as, as Obama liked to call it, and the U.S. regime was basically violating uh, human rights by killing many Iranians through preventing medicine from coming into the country during the, the Obama period. But today is very different. First of all, the United States, as your previous guest rightly pointed out, has isolated itself. Uh, it cannot the consensus building or the alliances that Obama tried to build or the coalition that Obama built, uh, I think Trump is incapable of doing so for a host of different reasons, both at home and abroad. And also, Iran's regional standing is very different. Iran, under Obama, unfortunately, the United States never fulfilled the JCPOA, the nuclear agreement, and therefore, and violated it repeatedly, as Trump did as well. So Iran, since it has always been under sanctions, it's now used to dealing with sanctions. So it's going to be much more difficult for the United States. And also countries like Russia and China, because they are both under U.S. pressure, the Chinese, the, the trade war that everyone's talking about, and Russia, the sanctions that the United States uh, uh, has right. imposed upon it, has caused these two countries to move closer to Iran, and now Iran will move closer to them. And they know that if the United States succeeds in uh, financial warfare against Iran, which is similar to military warfare, it's brutal and, and barbaric, they know that they'll be next. Michelle Dunn, what do you make of that? Well, I would say that, um, look, um, I agree with what Ali said that, um, you know, part of the weakness of the strategy that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo put forward is the economic part, right? Would, would, there, would the United States really be able to impose tougher sanctions on Iran now, the toughest ever, you know? Um, the Trump administration is fond of those, you know, of those, uh, that kind of hyperbole. It, it seems unlikely because there's less solidarity in the international community, and there are many complicated things about sanctions that require um, a certain amount of voluntary compliance, okay? I also agree with what Ali said about, you know, that I don't think Iran's behavior in the region, in Syria and other places we've been arguing about, is directly related to having more money as a result of sanctions relief. So all, all of that, uh, I agree with. I want to point out one thing, though. Just which quickly, is though, Ms. Dunn, because we I don't have very long left, very and I would like to get to Ali Maz again, but please do finish your point. Okay, we do have a very dangerous regional situation with Israel and Iran now engaging each other more directly uh, 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 on the, you know, on the ground of Syria at this point, but it could become a more direct engagement than that. And um, we're getting we're getting into the the possibility of a broader regional and, conflict and I would like somehow to, centering on And I would like uh, Mr. Vaz to have the last word on that. Is that where we're headed? Absolutely. Tensions in the region are rising, and there is a lot of friction between Iran and the U.S. and their respective allies. Uh, and a single miscalculation where there is no diplomacy can obviously result in a clash that could spiral out of control. But make me let me make uh, this last point, that I think the question that the administration has failed to answer is whether killing the nuclear deal has actually helped it in any way to address the other broader aspects of Iran's policies that it has a problem with. Um, you know, the, the, the situation we're in now is that Iran and the European Union are trying to figure out a way to weaken U.S. sanctions, uh, which is a very different situation than 2012 when the, the European Union and the U.S. were trying to put pressure Mr. on Baz, Iran. I am afraid. And the subject of discussion in Brussels is not Iran's regional policy, it's Iran's nuclear program once again. 
I'm afraid that we've run out of time, but thank you to all of our guests, Michelle Dunn in Washington, D.C., Mohammed Mirandi in Tehran, and Ali Vyas in Washington, D.C. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Peran and the whole team here, bye for now.